Hey guys. Um, so this is the art of closing a sale. Uh, I think this is your last presentation for this week, so congratulations. You guys all made it. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, so I was most recently the VP of growth at Chartio, uh, which basically means that I ran both the sales and marketing teams. Um, I built both teams from the ground up, um, and then I grew out an inside sales model from what I would consider uh, a traditionally like a pure SaaS model, which is essentially everybody comes in, they all try, whenever they want to buy, then they come in and click through your storefront as opposed to actually talking to somebody. Um, and in that capacity, I grew out revenue uh, 7x in 18 months. So uh, what I'm here to talk to you guys about today is, is how do you close a deal, right? Um, and I think that there's been a lot that's been said um, in the last two days about sort of how do you qualify, how do you get somebody to talk to you, and all this other stuff. Um, and then I feel like a lot of times people sort of assume that, well, now that I'm talking to somebody and they see my product, they're gonna love it so much that they're just gonna buy it. And that is patently false, that never happens, right? That's the fairy tale that everybody likes to tell. Engineers love, I put my product in front of you guys, you guys all buy it because it's so awesome, it's so amazing. No, that never happens, right? So what actually happens? Uh, well, you probably pass a qualification of some sort, you pass through a demo, you do a POC, you do a pilot, and then you sit there and you ask your prospect, are you guys ready to buy? And then they say, not really. There's a couple problems here, and you sit there thinking to yourself, crap, now what? So, oftentimes to get a deal to close requires three things, right? One of them is basically successfully navigating objections, which in my mind is basically the most important thing. Uh, because without that, then these other two don't really matter that much. Uh, so there's navigating objections, there's working with urgency, and then negotiating to a win-win situation, right? So objection handling. Uh, the traditional framework for objection handling is called the LAER framework. Um, I think some of you guys might find this, uh, some, some of you guys might be familiar with this already, because this is basically the same framework as active listening, right? Which is basically you listen, you acknowledge, you explore, you respond, so on and so forth, rinse and repeat, right? Um, so how does that play out in actual sort of a real life situation? Um, usually when I think about this, I think about acknowledgement is actually one of the most important parts, even though it sounds really dumb. Um, but you sitting there saying like, I hear what you're saying and this is what it means to me, it allows for a couple things. Uh, it allows you to sort of acknowledge their feelings, how they're feeling, um, but it also allows you to sort of clarify and make sure that you actually understand what it is that they're actually saying when they say these things. Um, so you repeating it back to them lets them cl clarify, add more details or not, and then it basically allows you to segue seamlessly into exploring, right? So how does that look into real life? So if the objection is like, we don't have budget, the acknowledgement becomes, I understand that you don't have budget right now, which is like my little clarification there. When's your next budget cycle, right? Let's do a deal then. Let's get you to pay then. Let's do something around that idea, right? But that doesn't actually mean that you don't like my product, which is the other thing. Uh, objection of, we want an X feature, but you don't have it. So I understand that you're looking for X, which does this. I don't know what this is, but like, I don't know. Um, what about that functionality do you actually find useful, right? Is it something that I provide to you with a different functionality that I just wasn't able to mention before? Or is it something that I just don't have and just say like, look, you know what? We don't do this. If this is 100% something that you need, let's just call it quits now. Right? The most important thing about getting into a sales cycle is understanding when to get out of that sales cycle. The worst thing that you guys can be done is, is for you guys to get stuck in limbo, spending time, sending resources, trying to get something to somewhere where there's just no chance. Right? So you always want to make sure that your resources are applied um, so that you guys are the most successful and can be like pushing towards something. So let's look at like how this looks like in real life. So what I put together for here is like a case study. This is something that actually Char uh, Chartio entered into uh, in one of their very, very first sales cycles. Um, and so I basically just changed out the names, um, but the rest of this is, is totally true. So Chartio entered a sales cycle with a mid-stage startup called Atlas. This is probably somebody that was, um, I think they're like post-series B, probably about 20 million plus in funding, 100 employees, pretty decent size, right? Um, and we were going up against Digit Data, uh, which is, another startup that was super, super, super well-funded, post-series C, about 500 employees, um, but the industry reputation for them is, is really, really, really poor, right? And so I probably should have prefaced this by saying like what Chartio does. So Chartio is basically a SaaS-based BI tool. Um, the, the, the tagline for us and sort of like the value prop for us is basically analytics for everybody. So for us, um, 
you don't need to know SQL or anything else to be able to export, uh, to be able to query data, transform it, and do anything else that you need to do to analyze it, right? The goal of that is to basically shift resources off of your data team or your engineering team and into your business users, like marketing, sales, whoever, okay? So going into this deal, we felt like we had an edge, right? And there's three reasons why. One of them is our CEO is close friends with the Atlas CEO, right? Um, that didn't mean that they were gonna buy us outright, but it basically meant that we had tacit approval um, and that we knew that we were gonna get a bear shake even though we were getting, going up against what would be considered a larger industrial player, right? Uh, the second one is our value prop aligned closely with Atlas's standard problem. So they basically said, we're at 100 people now, we have all this data, we wanna make sure everybody uses it, and they can't, right? Right, that's perfect, that's what we do. Um, and the third one is basically, traditionally once we get people into the trial, we have great buy-in, because our product is that good, right? Especially compared to something like Digit, which has like a really poor industry reputation, where people, a lot of people think of them as sort of like vaporware. Um, says a lot of things, but actually doesn't really work. So what ended up happening? We lost, badly, it wasn't even close. Um, and so when we look at this, we look through sort of we presented well, we got into the trial, we got everything went there, and then once we hit the objection stage, we just sort of flopped, right? And so what I did is I teased out the objections here for you guys to take a look at. Uh, there are really two of them, right? One of them was your trial period was too short. Second was we were more successful with Digit, right? Now, using that sort of LAER framework, what does that actually mean? Well, your trial period was too short pretty much means that uh, so when we teased it into them, they basically said, look, we didn't have the resources to commit at the start of the project, um, so by the time we got those resources, the evaluation period was almost done, so your trial period is too short. Uh, when we did have the resources, we were only able to assign a junior engineer to the project, uh, and because we were strapped for time, we opted for a quick and dirty setup, right? Now, we were more successful with Digit, and this is why we were more successful with Digit, was because, one, uh, we put our best digit engineer to work on that project, because that project seemed much harder. Uh, we forced, uh, or they forced us to basically perform a lot of database engineering, which is why they got their best engineer on it, uh, to optimize their database for analytics. Um, but we never, we neglected to ever use that same setup with Chartio, right? And the third one is basically, uh, which is, I think is amazing by the way, uh, but they basically, they called every single decision maker within Atlas and they basically got them to make sure that they didn't say no. They didn't have to say yes, they just couldn't say no, right? Uh, which is brilliant, if you guys ever had the time, and the resources to do that, go for it, right? Cool. So, now that we know this, it's time to handle those objections, right? No, it's too late. Basically, at the point that you're done with this evaluation period, and they've already made a decision, they're never gonna go back and do that, right? So basically, by the time they've basically gone through like a three-week eval, a four-week eval, a five-week eval, you're going back and saying like, great, well, why don't you just do this and evaluate this again, no, there's too many cycles already lost. They've already made a decision that they're comfortable with. They're done, right? So really what this means is that the objection process actually has to start way earlier, right? Uh, because by the time you get to this point, well, things have already been set in stone. So what's really the framework for doing this? Um, is basically one, understanding your prospect's landscape, understanding how your prospect buys, um, diffusing any bombs before they blow up, and then engaging in a give and take. Right? So, understanding the landscape. Um, I found this graphic for GI Joe, by the way. I like it a lot. Knowing's half the battle, the other half is red lasers, the other half is blue lasers. Um, but you actually have to watch that to probably get it. Um, anyways, understanding the landscape. These are the types of questions that you can ask for understanding, right? So, what's the problem that you're dealing with, right? And this is actually gonna look a lot like sort of like qualification questions, because they really are. Because qualification questions are not just based on uh, are you guys, do you guys qualify, but also just sort of information gathering in general, right? So what's the problem that you're dealing with? Who does this problem affect? How big is this problem is really that, what that question is going for? Um, why are you looking into solving this problem now? How big is this problem for you, right? How soon do you need a sol solution? How much time do you need? How much, is it like a, is this a one week out type of thing? Is this like a, is this like a one year type of thing? Or is this like a 10 year type of thing? In which case it basically sounds like you don't really care about it, right? Um, what will happen if you can't find a solution? How much is this solution actually worth to you, right? Uh, what are you prepared to do to find a solution? How many resources are you prepared to invest into this? Um, if I asked you to do this, would you be willing to do this or not, right? Again, it's really about sort of need. How big of this is this for you? Um, have you tried to solve this problem before? 
So that's really around sort of, if you failed before, why? What's changed? Do I anticipate that this is gonna be a better sort of cycle than what you did before with somebody else, right? Um, and if it did, then what's different now, right? Um, and then the other one is understanding the buy process. So who's gonna be signing off on a purchase decision? Is it just you? Can you, are you the one who's needed? Or does other people have to approve? Does it have to be your CFO? Does it have to be legal? Does it have to be privacy? Who else has to get involved in this for us to make a successful deal, right? Uh, if the decision's on, is the decision on what to buy solely yours or will other people have a voice? Are you gonna be the one who chooses this or is this a decision by committee? Do I have to, should I be presenting to other people? Should I know who else is gonna have a voice in terms of saying, yes, I wanna buy this or no, I don't wanna buy this? Um, and then if you decide what you wanna buy a solution, what would the next steps be? Oh, ignore that, if so, what's different now portion of it, but yeah. And then diffusing the bomb, right? This is actually something that I think a lot of people don't a lot, put a lot of emphasis onto and wrongly, right? Because oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll listen to deals and I'll listen to sales reps and they'll sit there and say, I think that they're gonna be concerned about security. Our security is not that great. And then my question will always be, well, what are you gonna do about that? And usually the response is something along the lines of, I'm gonna hope that they don't ask that question. No, don't do that. Never, 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 never do that, right? If you see something coming, deal with it because by the time it gets to you, it's gonna be so big that you're going to fail when it comes and hits you, right? So, how would you defuse a bomb? So for pricing, I'm sure you're concerned about price. Our typical deals range from 70K to 100K annually. Is that a problem for you, right? Commitment, uh, I love the fact that you wanna to come to us and you wanna trial with us. We'd love to move forward with that. Let's go about the project and the resources that are required on both sides to ensure that we have everything allocated appropriately. Right? This ensures that like uh, with the Atlas example that they, don't ha that they have resources at the beginning of the project as opposed to three weeks, four weeks in. Right? Project milestones. How are you judging the ultimate success or failure of this pilot? If we can deliver on these four items, would you be willing to sign today? Right? Because uh, I think one thing that you guys will find as you get into evaluations and stuff like that is there's a lot of sort of like feature creeping that goes on. Oh, and now I want to see this. Now I want to see this. Now I want to see this. Hold on, does that really actually answer the whole question or are you just kind of like wanting to see things to see things, right? So this basically keeps that in scope. Building towards win conditions. Um, so I understand that you don't have the resources on hand right now to set this up, um, but we know how big of a project this is for your company. Let's give you a running start by building a POC ourselves and then helping your resources get up to speed as quickly as possible, right? So how do you get, to, how, do you get how do you maneuver past these things that, are, that look like sort of potholes in the road, right? Uh, can you skip past them? Are there any other ways that you can move your, maneuver your way around? A lot of this is sort of exploratory sort of ideas, right? And then keeping in radio contact. This is another thing that happens a lot of times within sales cycles is that prospects end up going dark. Great, I love it, I'm gonna talk to you next week. Let me shoot you an email. That email never shows up, right? I'm gonna call you, uh, call never happens. You call them, they never respond. You email them, they never respond. Uh, what happens now? Nothing. Now you're in limbo. Terrible place to be. Right? So how do you keep in radio contact? Thanks again for the meeting today. I know that you want to circle back with the rest of your team before moving forward. Let us set up some time to discuss the feedbacks and explore next steps. How does next Wednesday at 3 p.m. look for you? Schedule the next meeting before your meeting ends. Right? So uh, engaging and give and take. Um, so for me, like, this, is, uh, this is actually something that I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of founders, a lot of young companies that don't have sales experience. Uh, do a, a poor job of this, right? Um, and it's basically this idea of, I think that oftentimes people are so happy that somebody wants to buy their product that they don't wanna do anything to sort of piss off the prospect, right? Um, you want more time? Great, perfect, let's do that. We'll give you more time. You know, you want a discount? Sure, yeah, 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 we can do something, yeah. Um, that never works out very well, right? Um, what you really wanna be able to do is, is you guys basically want to be able to engage in a meaningful conversation and provide meaningful value. And oftentimes that actually requires you to say no sometimes. Give reasons as to why this isn't a good idea, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that I see a lot, especially recently with startups, is this idea of I wanna remove all the friction out of the sales process. No, friction is in there for a reason. And if it's, not in a reason, if it's not in there for a reason, then you should get rid of it, right? But friction in the sales process can be a good thing, right? If you think back to that Atlas example, Digit forcing Atlas to build a better infrastructure for data is a huge friction, right? Like that's a huge thing that they made them commit to. But making them commit to that makes them ultimately successful, right? 
So don't worry about putting friction in there if it's there for a good reason. If it's not there for a good reason, then yeah, take it out, sure. Um, don't light yourself on fire to keep your prospect warm. Um, this is basically speaks to this idea of, um, you know, stop bending over backwards to make sure that your prospects are happy. Uh, because truthfully, oftentimes, like what you're providing, your, your solution is the solution to their problem, right? You don't have to be nice to them as long as that solution works. You should be respectful and everything else, but if they're saying something that's patently wrong or they're asking too much of you, you should be able to say no, right, without sort of fear. Um, be willing to challenge your prospects' needs, needs and assumptions. Um, don't give up things that are important to you without concessions from your prospect, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And then hold your prospects accountable, right? Hey, you said if I delivered X, Y, and Z that you would sign. I've delivered X, Y, and Z. Where's your signature, right? What does that look like? Is there something else that's blocking up that sale? Um, so that's that. Leveraging urgency. So. In terms of urgency, there's two types, right? There's natural urgency and there's artificial urgency. So natural urgency is basically stuff that's generated by business needs or market conditions. So for example is, if your prospect says, we told the CEO that we would have a decision by the end of the quarter, we need to have that, right? That's a natural urgency, right? Um, another one could be basically be, um, you know, there's a, new, there's a new mandate, there's a new legal mandate that says that we have to have something in place by April 15th. Another sort of natural, natural urgency, right? And you can start to leverage that throughout the sales process to sort of continue to sort of move it along, right? So you're basically sitting there saying, hey, I thought you said that you, you know, I know that's important to you because you told your CEO that you're gonna have this by the end of the quarter. For us to get to that point, we need to get to this decision for this portion of the project by next week, right? Um, but really all you're doing, you're all, really the only thing that you can do right there is you can basically highlight and you can kind of encourage prioritization, right? Um, you can't really sort of sit there and say, you have to sign a deal now because of this, right? Uh, artificial urgency is basically stuff that's created by the sales rep. Um, and a lot of times that can only really be used to sort of force a decision, right? So this is again, how do I get out of limbo territory? Um, and this is most commonly sort of built around sort of scarcity and concessions. So what does that look like? That basically looks like, you said you wanted to enter into a trial period with me. It requires, you know, one of my sales engineers time but uh, they already have six projects that they're working on. I would love to sign you up for a slot for prioritization now if you say yes now to entering into an evaluation and getting that rolling. If not, we may have to wait one month, two months, three months, however long that is, before we have more resources that are freed up, right? That also looks like, hey, I told you that I would be willing to give you a 15% discount, and I'll give that to you if you're willing to sign by the end of this week, right? Can you get the signature for me by the end of this week? Naturally, that's basically leveraging artificial urgency to force decisions, right? Uh, one of my other favorite ones is actually, hey, our prices go up by next quarter or by end of the month, so I need this, I need you to sort of enter into this, or I need you to enter into this evaluation before now so I can lock you in, right? Things like that basically force people to make a decision of am I in or am I out, and then act accordingly, and then hopefully, and then hopefully you know at that point, do I continue to commit resources to this or do I remove myself out of this sort of equation? Um, and then negotiate. So negotiating in, in a lot of ways is, is it's pretty simple. Um, you should only negotiate like once that solution is sold, right? So you shouldn't be negotiating to sell something. They should be sitting there saying, this is a solution that I want, but it's too expensive. Great, what price is it that looks that it's actually favorable to you? It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be, hey, you know, I'm really liking what I'm seeing so far, but this price seems kind of expensive. Can we talk about this now? No, because you don't want to get, you don't want to basically conflate negotiation and pricing with the actual product. Does the product say, does the product sort of serve the need? And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, or if that need is, is too small, then great. Then now I know to scope it out versus basically just trying to sort of cut everything down. Um, so once you do that, you should always be mindful of long-term impacts of any concessions that you make. Um, so when I think about this, I think about oftentimes Early on, in, uh, early on in a startup's life, it feels like it's really easy for you to basically offer a 50% discount um, to, a low, to somebody because that gets just dollars in the door, right? Um, does that make sense if, you know, five years, six years from now, they're still paying the same amount, even though they've maybe grown into, they've also maybe grown into basically being like uh, Fortune 500, they've IPO'd whatever else, and they're still paying you like $10,000 a month? No, probably not. Um, and that's something to be mindful of as you sort of move forward. 
Because um, oftentimes, you actually going back and having to renegotiate that is, is a really bad experience on everybody's side. It's a waste of resources on your end, uh, and they're not going to have any love for you, and they're probably going to open up the reopen up that evaluation process later, right? Um, and the other thing is basically contracts are like salaries. Eventually, everyone's always going to know what you're what you're asking people to pay, right? So if you gave X company a 50% discount, chances are by the end of the by the end of a few months. Y company and Z company is going to know about it because they have friends that work there, they have friends that know that price, and they're going to come asking for that price. Right? And what do you say at that point? Uh, and really, the goal for negotiating is to close the deal immediately. Right? You basically want dollars in hand as opposed to, uh, as opposed to hopefully getting those dollars later. Right? So again, that basically speaks to the original point, which is that negotiating once the solution is sold, um, as opposed to basically negotiating to sell the solution. Uh, and then typical negotiating levers. Um, I find like people like this a lot, uh, but X months free. So if you sign a one-year contract, I'll give you three months free. So you basically you sign now, but your next your next billing cycle is 15 months from now. Um, backloaded payments. This works really well if somebody likes the product a lot, um, but doesn't have budget for this quarter or this year. Uh, you can basically change the payment type. So you can sit there and say like, okay, well then you only ha you can pay twice. Uh, every six months, your first six months is like maybe $6,000, your next six months is like $20,000. So backloading that gets you through the budget cycle, um, but gets you still at the same ACV that you were at before. Uh, One-time discounts, this is basically like a discount for 15% for the first year. Every subsequent year is, back at, is basically back at the full price, um, so that basically helps you maintain your ACVs. Uh, marketing concessions, this is, uh, marketing concessions are, are nice, but they're also dangerous. Um, the reason why they're dangerous is because it's really easy to basically sit there and say, great, I'll do it for a testimonial, I'll do it for a testimonial, I'll do it for a testimonial, or a case study or whatever else. Um, and then maybe six months from now, you look back at it and you've got like a backlog of 30 case studies and none of those companies are very good. Uh, and by that I mean like, you sit there and say, great, XYZ company uses us and everybody else looks at you and says, who cares? That's probably a bad thing. So be very, very, very uh, mindful of what you give marketing concessions for. Um, but it's great for if you're looking to break into a larger industry um, or if you're looking to break into like a larger bracket of, uh, of enterprise, SMBs, you're, for, you're basically your first move in there. Uh, because people use it to look and sit there and say like, great, you know, um, these guys use us, so we should use them, right? So uh, an example for that is like at Chartio, we had WeWork as one of our biggest customers. And we actually had people come in uh, who were also like in that office space type of um, industry. So you're gonna say like, I, I read your WeWork case study, I thought it was great, we wanna do the same thing that they did. Sign us up, right? Uh, and the other thing is extra services, right? So uh, again, these, this is like sort of non-recurring payments, but if you could basically give an extra 20 hours of services from your sales engineer, or an extra like 15 hours of something, or some sort of like feature upkeep, um, that's a great way to sort of give value without actually sort of degrading your ACV levels. So that's pretty much that. Questions? So I think the question, uh, so I don't know if anybody else has heard of this, but, uh, or if all of you guys were able to hear that, uh, but the question revolved around, uh, if you're working a deal right now um, where you're trying to get it to close, and they keep on bringing up additional use cases, like, hey, maybe this department wants to look at it, um, or um, another department after that wants to look at it, how do I get that to close uh, specifically? Um, there's two ways that you can deal with that. So one of them is essentially is by, and, and this basically comes down to sort of like what you offer and is it worth it, right? So but there's two ways that you can do, deal with this. You could basically sit there and say, um, you could basically sit there and say like, well, let me get you under contract first, right? And then I can guarantee that as I get other portions of this use case out there, we'll discount it to this point where like it'll still be the same package as it was earlier, but now I can get your commitment now, right? Um, that's one way to do that. The worrisome thing about that, what people don't love about that is that sometimes like it'll affect, it'll affect your ACVs or it'll affect your basically your average sales price per user or whatever your pricing lever is um, because you're basically sitting there granting concessions through. Um, so the way that other people think about it is they basically talk about it as sort of like walled gardens. So great, um, this department is one walled garden, that department is another walled garden and these are all separate. Um, that applies better if they're working off of like different budgets uh, as opposed to if they're working off the same sort of centralized budget. 
Yeah, so, um, so as long as you don't publish your pricing, you can always back out of a pricing increase that you've promised because you can always just come back there and sit there and say, you know what, you came back to us, I'm gonna let me talk to my manager, see if I can offer you the same deal. Hopefully at this point you're not the CEO. Um, but let me talk to my board, or let me talk to somebody that sits there and says, like, let me see if I can get this back to you guys, because you guys have, you know, because I've talked to you for so long, I feel really good about you, all this other stuff. And then you come back like a day or two later and sit there and say, you know what, we can do it at this price if you sign. Again, if you sign immediately, right? Um, generally speaking, artificial pricing, or artificial urgency can backfire. Um, it generally doesn't backfire on the concession front of it, because you've already given up a concession, right? Uh, the only time it potentially backfires is in the circumstances which you said, stated, which is around sort of getting them in the door, uh, which is, or getting them to reevaluate because prices are going to go up, uh, in which case, you know, again, like you can back out of that. Oftentimes, as you, as you actually, if you watch like larger companies, so like if you watch Salesforce, for example, and all those other ones, um, those are actually very, very real price increases, and there is no backing out of that, right? You come back in a day later, they're like, sorry, too late. This is the new price, right? Um, and so the question, I think more of the question for you would be, um, are, you, are you willing to sort of go to that front? Because it does require you to play hardball, and it does require you to say no sometimes, right? If the price increase is justified as in like, look, like the cost that we're incurring is too much, and so I need to increase this price, then you feel a lot, you know, you personally probably feel a lot better about sitting there saying, holding firm on that, right? as opposed to you basically just sitting there saying like, oh, I'm just trying to get more revenue in the door, right? Um, so it kind of really sort of depends on one, your temperament and what you're willing to go to for that, um, as well as, hey, can that be justified in any way, right? It does make sense. Um, so the question is, if you're doing a, a deal with a large, with a long sales cycle, which probably means it's a very, very large size deal, and it involves multiple people within a company, so like let's say, multiple executives, the CEO, whatever else, does it make sense after that to set up individual sessions with each of those people um, or go write everything through your champion? And oftentimes, it kind of depends on your champion, right? Um, so hopefully, like, throughout this process, you have a good feeling of your champion of, are they willing to push me in front of them or are they, do they want to hide me, right? Um, really, actually, the best thing around that is actually if you have these one-on-one -on -one conversations but you include your champion in there. So, hey, like, what's better than a meeting with a CEO and a sales guy, right? Um, especially, like, when this guy is the one who brought him there. You bring him success, or you bring your champion success, um, then that's gonna reflect great on him or her throughout the rest of their lifetime there, right? Because I think, like, one of the things that, um, one of the things that, that I think maybe not a lot of people are cognizant of, um, if they haven't worked in a large company before, is but oftentimes, like, with these very, very, very large purposes, purchase decisions, um, their job is kind of on the line for this, right? I made this $100,000 purchase. If this goes south, my job is gone, right? Like that's a very, very, very real fear um, that a lot of these people have when they're bringing in these things. Um, so obviously you want to sort of work in a way that, um, that works well for them. Um, but also you should know that if you guys are very confident that you can be successful with them, that they're gonna reap the benefits of that later on in their career within that company, right? Um, but I think your ideal circumstances essentially is being able to set up those meetings one-on-one -on -one with the CEO or whatever else. You should always keep your champion aware of what's happening um, because if he or she can help facilitate or if they want to be involved or whatever else, it just works better. Because uh, chances are your champion is going to be the best way for you to understand the landscape of this is what the CEO thinks, these are the biases that the CEO has, these are the, maybe the objections that you're going to have to deal with there, this is what he or she likes or doesn't like about some stuff. Um, that allows you to have a much, much more successful meeting or uh, conversation with them later. So there's a lot of reasons why somebody can hide you. Uh, one of them, and this is something that you can sort of figure out as you're, uh, as you're throughout your sales process, um, but if, like, if they're new to, new to their role, um, there's actually a very, very, if they're new to their role and they don't actually have a lot of power in that role, um, then chances are they're gonna hide you, right? And you should actually know at that point that that's probably not gonna be a very likely sale because they don't have enough power to really drive through a six-figure deal, right? Um, now, if they try to hide you because they want to be front and center all the time, then that's different, uh, in which case it's up to you to basically arm your champion with all the information, all the data that they need. Uh, and so then it basically becomes, uh, which actually we did a lot of churning, it was basically, uh, hey, look, I know that you're gonna pitch this committee at this point, 
Um, let's talk through that. Let me prepare to give you all the information that you need to have the most successful pitch possible, um, whether that be custom, custom information, custom, uh, custom data that you have to like pull together, uh, what are the objections that they have? Then you get still have this conversation with this, with this champion that you would have if you were running the conversation. You're just kind of like once removed, right? Um, I think it's difficult because nobody likes to be the bad guy, right? Um, I've been, like I've worked at, I've worked at Yahoo in the past where to shoot down a project it took like going through six VPs because nobody wanted to say no. Why, you guys are all VPs, why can't you say no? Nobody wants to look like the bad guy. That happens quite a bit. Um, the other thing that happens quite a bit is, um, is if you feel like, hey, like this is like maybe like a 1A, 1B type of situation, so it's not a clear cut favorite, maybe I wanna keep you there, maybe I wanna use you, maybe I wanna leverage you in pricing later, right? Um, that happens a lot as well. So then they can basically sit there and say, hey, like I have Chartio that's coming in at like $20,000 and you're coming in at $50,000. I still like them, I'm still in contact with them. If you don't give me this pricing discount now, I'm gonna go to them, right? And Chartio's just sitting there saying like, I think things are going great. They're not going great, right? Um, and it's up to Chartio to basically sit there and figure out where do I actually sit and try to push people one way or the other, say yes or say no. Yeah, um, part of it is basically understanding how well do they understand the marketplace. So asking what competitors are you looking at, are you aware of like what those solutions have cost, is that something that you're comfortable with? That's one way to go about it. Um, the more research that they've already done, the more likely it'll be um, that they're willing to sort of expend into that. Um, other questions that you can basically ask are um, if you ask them about like the types of software purchases that they've done before, right? So, you know, tell me about like sort of something that, tell, tell me about the last thing that you guys purchased. You know, how much was that? What kind of solution was it? Uh, what the problem was? The other way that you can flip it around is you basically sit there and say, as during the qualification of uh, problem solution, how much is this problem costing you? Right? Why are you looking for the solution now? Right? How important is this to you? Because if it's worth a million dollars, then you know what's a hundred thousand, right? So what's a hundred thousand to, to solve it? Oh, um, it's all relative. So then I think the question basically becomes like, what is it that they bought, right? So if you think about sort of if you think about software purchases in general, right? There's probably things that are going to be like cornerstone purchases, right? So like on the sales side, your CRM solution is a cornerstone purchase. Um, on the marketing side, a marketing automation software might be a cornerstone purchase. Um, on like a uh, engineering side, something around sort of infrastructure and everything else might be cornerstone purchases. Security is like one of those, right? Um, understanding how much they're willing to pay for like those types of cornerstone purchases helps you get an understanding of how much they'd be willing to pay for something that's yours. Because um, if it's $20,000 but it's like a throwaway piece of software, great, I'm all in there, right? If it's $20,000 but it was for like, uh, you know, like some sort of like PCI compliant like firewall or whatever else, nah, I don't really want to play with that game. Right, especially if I know like what those things should be normally, and it's like a hundred thousand dollars right on. Unless there's a logo involved, in which case all all everything's out the door. But yeah. Cool. Other questions? Oh, okay. So I think the question is is what happens if you give somebody a discount? It's not good enough, but that's the best that you can do, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, you basically have to hold firm on that, um, and you. And I think what you basically sit there and say, uh, so, so the biggest question is, is, is sort of like, how do you act throughout this sales process, right? And this again comes down to sort of give and take. Are you somebody who's always bending over backwards for them? In which case, probably they're gonna think to themselves, hey, I can push this guy a little bit more, and he's gonna keep on bending over backwards and give me a better discount, right? Or if you've been basically very, very upfront with them, very, very uh, transparent with them, and you say no when you mean no, and you say yes when you mean yes, then when you sit there and say like, look, this is the best that I can do. They'll take you at your word, right? And then the question basically becomes, how do you navigate out of that objection, or how do you navigate out of that sort of that pricing uncertainty? Because then the question then basically becomes, you're saying that it's not good enough. Why is it not good enough, right? Is it not good enough because you don't have budget for this quarter? You have not have budget for this year? Um, is it not good enough because your CEO said you can only spend X amount for the software, right? In which case, let's put together like a multi-year deal, right? Let's start to look at this well, so for the budget one, if it's budget this year, budget next year, then it basically becomes about backloading. Um, but if it's around sort of like, my CEO says I can only spend this much this year, then great, let's start talking multi-year terms. This is even better for me. So if you can only spend $50,000, I'll give it to you for $50,000 this year, 
And as you guys prove out the value, then it's gonna be $70,000 next year, right? This is how I get myself to like a point where it's about equal, uh, or it, it's, it's pretty much, I didn't discount that much, I'm just basically moving money around. Because at the same time, like, and I think like the thing that you have to explain to them when you're sitting there saying like this is the best I can do is that there's a very real cost that's involved, and like this is the only way that we sort of can stay in business, right? Um, because the, and I think the point of it is basically when you sit there and say, um, if 50,000 is the best I can do, I will give it to you for 50,000 for this year, but it's gonna be 80,000 next year. They need to be aware that what you're doing is a one year, it's like sort of like a one year amnesty type of period type of thing, right? Uh, so it's not as if this is only worth this much this year. This is only worth this much this year in the context of a two year deal, right? If you don't have that two year deal, then this is not worth this much. This is now worth $70,000, which is what we had said before, right? Um, so getting them to understand exactly why you're pricing the way that you are, or the concessions that you're making and why you're making them, um, sort of help, help them understand really sort of like where are the boundaries. Um, no, I mean, I think like that's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, and really it's largely around this idea of like why is it that you want to think about this in a larger scope, right? Um, chances are if you're an IT director, um, you're thinking about this in one of two ways. One of them is basically if I roll in five, then I probably get it cheaper across each department than if I were to buy it each individually, which is a fairly standard way to look at it. Um, and the other way to look at it is basically like, I don't want these other four to buy something different and for me to have to maintain five different things, right? Um, so once you better understand sort of where they're coming from from that perspective, then it basically allows you to better sort of uh, angle or frame your, frame your response, right? Um, so one of them is basically like, look, let's get this in now, which is like what you do, right? And then when these other four come on board, you know, we'll all push it into the same account, which basically means that it gets the, all the sort of like the normal sort of pricing concessions that you would get for account of this size. It'll just kind of grow naturally within that, right? Um, but if it is about sort of, um, but if it is around sort of like, I wanna make sure like these other four don't buy the same thing, I actually really don't care about the price, um, then it basically becomes this question of, you know, if, if that's the case, then actually you sitting there saying like, well, let me get into one first and then prove it out is probably actually not gonna work because that's not really the problem that they're trying to solve. They're trying to solve, does this fit for all five? Uh, and in which case, unfortunately, you probably have to back out and rescope it and then kind of re-engage. Cool. Other questions? All right. Thanks.